Okay, so moving on to objective two, let's look at the shape and their arrangement of prokaryotic bacterial cells. Remember, they're just a single cellular organism, but look how different they look. Look at the difference between a spirochete down on the bottom right and a coccus on the top left. These are all prokaryotic cells. They're weird and funky and cool. Okay, so the first word you need to learn is a coccus, and this just is like a little round ball, spherical. We'll look at, at cocci as plural, things like your streptococci, staphylococci. Ah, see where the cocci comes in on the end of those? They're spherical balls. A coccobacillus is kind of in between a long rod-shaped organism and a round shape. Vibrio are comma-shaped, and the classic organism that is uh, Vibrio is the organism that causes cholera. Uh, bacillus is a rod-shaped organism, and you can see it looks like a hot dog there. Those are the bacillus. Then we have the spirillium and the spirochete. The spirillium is a little loose, looser coiled. I don't know if you can say it that way, but it's a loosely coiled, and the spirochete is tightly coiled. Um, in a micro lab, these organisms are usually only seen on what we call dark field microscopy. Or, um, they're hard to see, and I couldn't tell the difference under the scope. I don't think of a sprillium and a spirochete, so we won't ask you to do that either, but just know that they are corkscrew shaped. Here's some fun pictures just to get you all excited about microbiology. Both the top streptococcus and bottom staphylococcus are both cocci, round shaped, and you can see they're just tiny, almost pinpoint. If you look up there at the strep, each one of those is a bacterial cell. Strep on the top forms chains, so this could be the strep that causes a strep throat. There's a lot of different strains. So we've got these long chains, and then on the bottom in the staph, they form more what we call grape-like clusters. They're clustered together. So we can stain that, look at it, tell the doctor this is what you got, and it's, it's quite helpful. In some bacteria, they form pairs. This is a diplococcus, diplococci, excuse me. Um, organisms like streptococcus pneumonia, or commonly called pneumococcus, is a diplococcus. Um, don't worry, you don't have to memorize that. Um, the viculture um, diplococci from a sputum that came from your lungs, I'm pretty sure you have pneumococcal pneumonia. And again, that helps with deciding the right type of treatment. Okay, here's some cartoon drawings next to electron microscopy. So on the left, you can see the staphylococci. Again, it forms grape-like clusters or balls. And then there's the electron microscopy picture. Streptococci, again, form chain, chains. Um, you can see the diplococcus there at the top of the cartoon. Also, the top electron microscopy picture is a diplococcus. And depending on if they're end-to-end -end or side-to-side -side gives us a clue also of the organism it is. Um, here's some more diplococci. You've got to look close to see them on the left, but on the right, that microscopy is wonderful, and you can see those diplococci forming end to end. That would be a streptococcus pneumoniae. It's basically the only organism that does that. Now, here's our rod shaped bacteria, bacilli, on the top right. Kind of hard to see. It looks like a mass of worms, maybe. But if you look really close and kind of get down to the individual ones, there are individual rods there. And E. coli that we talked about earlier is a rod-shaped bacteria. Uh, spirilla and spirochetes again. Uh, these are spirochetes on the bottom right. Dark field microscopy again. So cool looking. Um, spirochetes cause a uh, disease called syphilis. You may have heard of that among other things. So we're going to go in now to objective three and talk about how we stain these. I just showed you some gram stains when you saw the purple and pink ones that were not electron microscopy. Those were gram stains, and that's the 
classic stain that we would do um, if we wanted to tell, give the physician a quick look right off about what organisms were there. Now we only gram stain certain types of cultures. In your throat you have so many organisms that live there normally it would be silly to gram stain it because we'd see a whole bunch of stuff and who would know if it should be there or not. But in things like a wound or things that we would expect to be sterile, a gram stain can be very useful. I'm going to kind of explain this procedure to you and then we'll look at the slide. Um, if I got a gram stain in the micro lab, it's usually a swab. I'd swab it onto a slide and I'd put it over a little flame and heat fix it so that it didn't wash off. Okay, then I would add a layer of crystal violet. It's a blue dye, kind of purple looking. Let it sit for about a minute. And then I would fix it with iodine. Just kind of sets it in there. Okay, let it sit. And, you know, when you learn this procedure, if any of you are going to clinical lab, you'll have your watches out, you'll be timing it, and then after you get used to doing it, you just slosh it on there and kind of get a feel for it. Okay, then we do a quick rinse. Um, uh, with alcohol and then we add a counter stain which is this pink saffron stain. Now the organisms are going to either end up to be purple or pink. So let's look at the rationale behind that gram stain. Okay, so when we gram stain we're going to come up with either gram positive bacteria or gram negative. So we're going to make it, we're going to be able to classify them by color and size here. Um, remember when we looked at the bacterial cell wall and in a gram-positive organism they have a very thick layer of peptidoglycan and what we call tocoic acid. Here's the picture of that. So here on the top is the thick layer of peptidoglycan. Pink things are the tocoic acid in there. And compare it to a gram-negative wall. It's got this tiny little purple peptidoglycan layer and then a lot of lipopolysaccharides in this. So their cell walls are different. That's the basis of the staining. Um, that when we put that purple crystal violet stain on, when the, we've got the big, thick peptidoglycan layer, let's flip back over to that, it's going to hold it. It locks it in there. So that when we put the alcohol on there, it doesn't release the stain. Then you put a counter stain on pink, it's already stained. It's not going to stain again, so they come out purple. Okay, on the gram-negative cell walls, it's just this little tiny bit of chain link fence around it. It doesn't hold the purple stain when you put the alcohol on there to rinse it. It rinses it right away. We add a pink saffron counter stain, and it stains pink. So we can tell the difference between the two, and that's the mechanism of the gram stain. In this short video, we're going to take a look at gram staining. Now, the materials you're going to need are clean microscope slides. Um, they may have to be cleaned with a, a, um, a methanol uh, pad before we use them. We're going to need our gram stains, and we should get everything ready before we're going. Of course, we need a specimen and uh, something to apply the specimen with, lots of paper towels and distilled water. Now, you can either use a, a colony from a Petri plate, or you can use a colony from broth, as shown here. And uh, the best way to transfer these to the slide is to use a, a, sterile, uh, a sterile swab. And uh, this is the proper technique uh, for peeling out um, back the paper cover. And you'll notice the technician is holding the uh, cap, uh, holding the tube in his left hand, and is uh, using it, holding the cap in the right hand using the pinky finger, and is twisting it back and forth with the left hand. Uh, we're very careful, of course, not to touch anything with the swab until we do our transfer. Now, this is showing a, a microscope slide on a template, and the template, which is printed on paper, has spaces for A and B. We might compare a gram positive and a gram negative strain, or maybe we're comparing a known, an unknown rather, to a known strain. So there you can see the two applications. Uh, next it goes to the slide warmer, and typically that's five to ten minutes, but you need to check and make sure it's dry. If it's not dry, leave it on the, sl on the slide warmer for a longer period of time.
Now, this is uh, one example of how we might treat the slides. Um, you can see the clothespin there, which is going to be used as, a, as an inexpensive slide holder. Um, this particular rack, which is in the sinks in T231, is very good because we can uh, flood and clean up fairly easily. Now we're applying the Graham uh, Crystal Violet uh, dye, and that's going to be for 30 seconds. So we're going to put two to four drops on each uh, spot. So we have an A and a B spot, so we're going to have then two spots of the Crystal Violet uh, stain. And then we'll count for 30 seconds. And uh, then we need to wash the, um, the slide off. And so we're going to uh, hold it with the clothespin. And then using distilled water, we're going to wash it very vigorously. And as you recall, the crystal violet is going to be taken up by both cells. Now, as you can see, he actually washed both the back and the uh, front of the slide. Now, we've returned it, and we're going to add the Graham's iodine, which we're going to leave on for 60 seconds. Now, this is going to form the uh, CVI, the, uh, uh, CVI uh, crystals, the crystal violet iodine uh, crystals. Now, uh, this is a iodine is a mordant. It's going to complex with the crystal violet. Um, crystal violet is soluble, but the crystal vi violet iodine uh, Crystal violet iodine crystals are not. Um, so you can see the two areas, which we could actually see visually blue. Um, we're not going to let the whole 60 seconds elapse here um, in this particular uh, slide. Now, uh, we've washed them, and uh, we're decolorizing. Now, we flood the entire slide with decolorant, which is 95% ethanol acetone. And really, you just uh, leave it on for a few seconds. Um, it's not a very long procedure. And then we want to, again, rinse very quickly with uh, um, water. Now the uh, acetone uh, alcohol decolorant is going to be, um, it, uh, is, uh, will remove any unreacted crystal violet. So any crystal violet iodine crystals will remain behind. And then finally, we want to use a counter stain, which is safranin, uh, which is left on for 60 seconds. And again, safranin stains everything. So gram-negative cells, which were decolorized, will now be stained with the uh, safranin. Again, washing the back of the slide and washing the front of the slide. Now we need to blot. And so we're going to place the slide face up onto the blotting paper. We're going to fold it over one time. And then we're going to press down. Do not rub the slide. That's very important. If you rub, you're going to rub off the specimen, which is loosely bound to the surface and you'll have tear and streak marks. We're just going to push down and hold it down. And that's it. The procedure's done.